Dr. Sulaim and welcome to Tibet's Museum, my bi-monthly talk series. Today we have here Mr. Vincent Jigdilla, who is currently the International Coordinator for International Tibet Network, ITN. Mr. Jigdilla is a TCV alumnus and he is the former National Director of Students for a Free Tibet SFT UK and the Program Director of SFT India. He also worked as a consultant for Tibet Action Institute on online communications and security. And today he'll speak on uh, uh, Tibetan struggle, natural selection. Thank you, Vishula, <laughs> 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 uh, for that kind introduction. And I must say that uh, Tashila, director of Tibet Museum, uh, he initially approached um, uh, me and asked me to speak twice. And uh, how do you say in the U.S.? Third time, if you fool yourself, you <laughs> shame on you, right? So uh, I tried two times to uh, recommend and encourage him to someone else to speak, but I think you know, eventually it came back to me once again. So I couldn't say no. Um, so yeah, um, I think pretty much the picture says it all. Uh, this is how long it took me and what has become of me in the process of zeroing down on a session for this topic. And I admire Homer and particularly his wisdom, Homer Simpson. Um, so uh, how many of you here are students of biology or mathematics? No one? That's good. Any lecturers? Well, that makes things much more easier. Um, so yeah, uh, I think in the course of human life, human lives, it's interesting to uh, notice that we tend to say many things or the same things many times. Um, but given the fact we as a human often tend to, you know, uh, we tend to see but fail to observe and uh, we tend to uh, hear but fail to listen. And in such cases, uh, you realize that when these very same things or the main things are documented in one form or the other and then shared, then somehow you're successful in, in generating the required level of awareness. So with this analogy, I wanted to uh, explain my understanding of uh, Tibet's struggle in exile through natural selection. Now having said that, uh, I don't mean to contest the intricacies of the theory, but uh, simply to, uh, to help put my argument in a better, in a, in a, in a better explanation. So uh, like the picture says, I just wanted to, before we proceed, I wanted to make sure that we test our intelligence. And I uh, just wanted to ask, how many of you are aware of this picture? Anyone? Well, that makes perfect sense. We don't have any students from biology, <laughs> mathematics. No one? Well, when I was looking for the picture, I thought the other guy on the left was pretty much the trimmed version of the guy on the right, but these two are different characters. But uh, I think you'll figure it out as we proceed you know, with my presentation now. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. So how, how many of you are familiar with this picture? Everyone's familiar? Okay. Well, excellent. Uh, we're getting there. Now, let's move on to the third picture. How many of you are familiar <laughs> with this guy? <laughs> so we don't want to move down to that level of intelligence, right? Um, well, so that concludes our uh, test of intelligence. Now, uh, let's move on to this picture. How many of you are familiar with this picture? No one? Anyone? So this is the HMS Beagle ship, um, the very ship on which Charles Darwin he embarked on a voyage, and uh, through this voyage, he was able to make this landmark discovery, and which later helped him form, you know, a theory of natural selection. So, the other guy basically is Charles Darwin, right? Uh, I'll get to the other guy later on. You'll realize. So, uh, in his uh, voyage, what he discovered was he observed many different uh, species, and he figured that there were a lot of resemblances. But at the same time, there were many subtle differences, right? And he attributed these uh, subtle differences to the creature's ability to adapt, adapt to reality. Uh, and he realized those creatures who actually were able to survive or overcome the struggle for existence, they survived. And which, in a manner of speaking, is to say that they evolved. And I believe that, uh, likewise, for any movement to sustain and survive, we need to evolve. So that is why, um, on that note, you know, um, I would like to present my understanding of our struggle here in exile by applying this general premise of the theory. 
So when I look into our struggle here in exile, I look, uh, look it through three different aspects, and that is um, institutions, population, and uh, campaigns. Now, this is a chart I worked on, and you can see the different years, you know, uh, where different institutions were established, right? And uh, one of the first and uh, the most remarkable thing that His Holiness did after coming in it, into exile, for which I think the movement and we as a people are forever indebted to, is establishing the Tibetan, Tibetan government in exile, uh, which now commands the legitimacy of the movement and the people in large. Um, you can see that was the first thing that was done when you came into exile. And then the Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts was established as a sort of a cultural revival and preservation center. And likewise, you know, we saw schools were later on established. So, uh, so here is, you know, like our central Tibetan administration base here in Himachal. And uh, earlier it was known as Tibetan government exile. And if you have time, please feel free to, uh, you know, make a visit. And Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts we have here in Dharamsala. Um, and schools, um, we have three different variations of schools. We have Central School for Tibetans, Tibetan Children's Village, and Sambara School. And Central School, uh, Central School for Tibetans is uh, basically managed by the Indian government, and the other two um, are either independent or under the, um, the, you know, under the Tibetan government exile. So they have you know, varying number of branches, 12 schools, 71 schools, 81 branches, sorry, eight branches. Um, and then, um, you have the monasteries as a sort of important centers for learning uh, Tibetan Buddhism and sustaining the Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, these are images of you know, three important monasteries of Tibet, you know, Sera, Trepung, and Ganden. Sera is, uh, these are all based in the southern, southern part of India. Sera is in Bailakubi and Trepung and Ganden, they're based in Mankot. And now let's talk about political NGOs and uh, I mean, there are a lot of different NGOs, but I think these NGOs uh, play an important role when you talk about movement in large. So, we have the Tibetan Youth Congress, um, they have their center here in Dharamsala. Um, it's one of the largest Tibetan NGO, and they have chapters, I think around, more than, sorry, I don't get the number. I think around 76 chapters all over, and, uh, sorry, 87 chapters. And then you have the Tibetan Women's Associations, which were later formed around, I think, 1980s. And uh, their initial task is to advocate for the Tibetan cause and also uh, to encourage um, you know, women empowerment in the community. And then you have uh, the Kuchusum, former political prisoners you know, uh, organization. Um, and then you have the National Democratic Party of Tibet, which was uh, established around 1994, basically to create and promote democracy in the community. And finally, you have Students for Free Tibet, which was established um, in and around 994. It's a grassroots organization and um, it advocates for Tibetan cause. And I know you're from Tibetan Youth Association in Europe. We'll come to that part. But I think these are, if you're looking, based in Switzerland, right? Uh, but I think primarily, I think these uh, uh, NGOs have played a, a pivotal role in the Tibetan movement. And likewise, you know, as you know, as we evolved and you know, gradually many other NGOs came into existence. Um, so I think when you're talking about evolution, right? One uh, one of the aspects that I spoke about earlier was about the population, right? So it's important that we need to look into the Tibetan diaspora. Um, so I think, you know, uh, in exile, uh, including, you know, the, t uh, the population inside Tibet, we make around, in exile, we make around 2% of the Tibetan population. And uh, it is believed that around 150,000 Tibetans are based into exile. And I've retrieved this data from one of my other friend, also known as Jigdel, he's based in Canada, so he's into this project called TibetData.org, and you can see how the populations are distributed. In India, you have almost an like actual you know, population, almost close to 100,000, and likewise. So if you look, uh, try to look into all over the world, and you can see that uh, apart from India, Nepal, and Bhutan, you can see the largest contingent of Tibetan diaspora is based in the US, right? and followed by Canada, and then of course, um, followed by Switzerland. Switzerland also makes one of the largest contingent of, you know, uh, one of, it makes one of the largest areas where you have the largest contingent of Tibetan population in Europe. So likewise, you can see how the Tibetan population is 
they have been distributed. And same. Likewise, here's a snapshot. Um, so I think uh, uh, in the course of our you know uh, struggle for existence, this kind of later uh, manifested you know Tibetans gradually immigrating to West, and I think. Uh, Tibet's immigration to the West have made significant contributions and played an important role in propagating the cause of Tibet. And uh, this is an image of uh, you know, the first Swiss immigrants into Switzerland. So I think um, the, the distributions of Tibet, especially in Europe, if you look into Switzerland, clearly justifies this fact, right? So this is sort of the first kind of you know, Tibetans going out of you know, uh, India or Nepal in Bhutan. And it was in Switzerland, and then you have the U.S. Immigration Act in 1990. The U.S. government passed this Immigration Act, which generously accepted 1,000 Tibetans from India and Nepal. And uh, this kind of uh, played a significant role in allowing Tibetans, Tibetans to immigrate to the U.S. And then you have the uh, the Canadian Immigration and Refugee Protection Act 2012 and the Canadian government was very generous to accept 1,000 Tibetans from Arunachal Pradesh settlements in Arunachal Pradesh, which is in the northeast part of India. And basically, you know, Tibetans immigrating to the West allowed them to play to the strength of their countries uh, in advocating you know, the Tibetan cause. Now that, uh, so these concludes two aspects of uh, the, the Tibetan movement or Tibetan struggle here in exile. Now, I think looking into campaigns, uh, I think this picture says it all. And I, th I think for a movement, it is important that it has to be a multivariable. And I think it takes no science to argue that, uh, given our circumstances, the circumstances then when we first arrived here into exile, um, one of the most sort of common or natural form of expressing our dissent against the Chinese government is through protest and, uh, and in that case it would have been less likely organized or coordinated um, but interestingly you know according to a survey we did in 2010 protest still remains one of uh, the most sort of you know uh, preferred form of tactics in terms of a campaign um, but let me tell you that pro in this case protest alone is uh, not you know the tactics that is employed within our movement. So uh, you know you, you can have access to this report if, uh, on our website tibetnetwork.org, or else you can let me know. Um, so uh, I think gradually uh, what happened was over the course of mo movement, we kind of gradually evolved from the streets to impacting changes at places where actual policies are made. So for instance, uh, this is direct action uh, you know, by students who are free to bed. And there were many other groups who kind of uh, were intensively involved in a month-long campaign. And what actually happened was because of these intensive campaign, initially uh, uh, a loan of, of around $40 million was rejected uh, towards China by World Bank. And if that would have you know, gone ahead, it would have basically encouraged uh, a migration of around 60,000 Chinese into Tibet. So, so you can see how you know our movement, especially in terms of campaigns, is gradually evolving. Now here once again, and uh, this is in 2014. Now, using the mechanism of universal jurisdiction, uh, you know, Tibet groups were able to basically file lawsuit against former Chinese leaders. You know, you have the uh, President Jiang Zemin and uh, former Prime Minister Li Peng, and uh, and this uh, uh, lawsuit was pursued in Spain, where they abide by the universal jur jurisdiction mechanism, and uh, we were successful in this lawsuit. And eventually, the Spanish judge issued an international, you know, arrest warrant for these two leaders. Now, moving on to 2015, you have the. Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. Um, so what happened was basically, you know, this was a bipartisan bill. Uh, 
introduced by uh, in Congressman Jim McGovern, he's a Democrat, and you have Joseph Pitts, I don't think you can see that, he's a, a Republican, a former congressman, and what this bill basically does is uh, it asks uh, China to allow unfettered access to U.S. citizens into Tibet, because that is highly restricted, and if China fails to do so, U.S. would reciprocate that act to any Chinese officials. So that is the uh, main gist of the bill. Okay. Um, so you can see that uh, our movement now it's becoming more multilateral, and and I think here I would like to bring Tibetan Youth Association into Europe into the picture. Um, so we have uh, we have our advocacy coalition present most of the time, especially whenever there are you know hearings at the UN and uh, we have our representatives and this is basically a sort of a joint collaboration between Tibet Justice Center, Students for Free Tibet, and you have Tibetan Youth Association in Europe, you know, representatives, right? And uh, of course in Tibet Network. And we have a similar sort of advocacy week here in India and this fall during the monsoon session, you know, uh, parliament session, you know, a team from here will be heading down to Delhi and will be uh, lobbying members of the Indian parliament and also meeting other dignitaries. So. Now, you know, as, as we gradually evolve, we have, you know, our, our movement becomes more multilateral and then uh, you can see how it's, it has become more coordinated. And uh, for instance, in the case of 2008 Beijing Olympic, it was not just in Beijing that we were able to carry out this huge, massive campaign. It was, it was basically all over, you know, around the world. And uh, that time I was in the UK, we were able to protest against the Chinese torch relay and uh, Likewise, the same was done in France and, and the U.S. and San Francisco. And here's a picture of the G20 protests in Australia. And uh, this protest, uh, you know, this campaign was carried out not just alone in Australia, but all over the world. Okay. So you're happy, right? I've included TYA. <laughs> yeah. You can say that to your president <laughs> later on. Um, okay, so then... I think it's also important to notice that how um, we have, within our movement, we have started making emphasis on collaborating with other, you know, rights advocate group and also you know, Chinese uh, uh, dissidents, Chinese human rights advocate activists, and you have uh, Southern Mongolian activists, you have, uh, you know, activists from East Turkestan, and here is an image, and here here is a joint statement that was released through Tibet Network. Uh, in light of the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. And also, uh, here's my friend Xiao Jing. He's a former survivor of the Tiananmen massacre. And he is, he's here in the UK, and uh, he was protesting Xi Jinping's arrival. And uh, over there, you can see you have uh, this uh, collaborative campaign along with, you know, Rabia Khadir. Uh, she's representing the East Turkestan movement. And also, uh, when opportunity arises, we, uh, we try to hold side events within the UN or elsewhere. So this is a sort of a collaborative project called Human Rights Defender, which was, I think, it was done in the UN as a side event. And, uh, and then you can see how uh, we kind of started sharing, uh, so, so we kind of started, uh, sharing solidarity with uh, the people of Hong Kong during the Umbrella Movement. And also uh, you have here in Taiwan sharing solidarity with the Tibetan cause and also we were able to uh, express a solidarity during the Sunflower movement here in Dharamsala. So I just wanted to give you a sense of you know like how in terms of you know like evolution of our tactics you can see these sort of you know, multi uh, layers of you know, tactics employed during our movement and this is a sort of a survey from our report and you can see that you know like the street protests of theaters are still like the you know, most often used tactics, but along with that, it is not the only form of tactics, but there are a number of different tactics that we have employed so far within the movement. And uh, in that survey also, we try to assess, you know, from their perspective, you know, what do they think is, is the best form of, you know, uh, tactics within the movement. So, you know, you have different variations of statistics. Now, I think uh, uh, coming down to sort of the sort of my final presentation. Um, I think it's important to, when you talk about, you know, uh, survival or uh, struggle for existence, it is important to realize 
what are the challenges, the foreseeable challenges, and I think I would attribute that challenge, you know, these challenges to this person. So you still have no clue of who, who he is. Charles Darwin, no, I said the, not Charles Darwin. This guy is Marco Polo. Okay, but I think, but he shares similarities with, uh, with Charles Darwin, right? So, uh, basically what this guy did was, in the 12th century, right, um, I think it, it took him around 24 years to go all over, and uh, in that course of time, he was able to you know, travel in different parts of the country, in Palestine, in Turkey, in Iraq, in Iran, in Afghanistan, and eventually kind of, you know, arriving at the, uh, at the court of the Mongol Emperor, Kublai Khan, uh, in Kambulai, right? Right now is presently known as Beijing. And, uh, and later on, like, during the course of his return, he was, uh, he, he traveled through, uh, sorry, he traveled through um, Burma and, uh, and also Vietnam, and also uh, along the you know, Indian Ocean uh, through, um, I think, Straits of Malacca, Sri Lanka, Yemen, Oman, east of Gujarat. So that is basically the route Marco Polo took you know, <coughs> uh, during the course of his 24 years of you know, voyage. Now, if we were to kind of uh, think of one geopolitical focus for this 21st century, we did not look further than this map. And all we have to do is basically um, superimpose this map with this one, and you realize the latter, which I mean this one, this map pretty much is a replication or a duplicate of Marco Polo's route. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than China's 21st century grand strategy. It's called One Belt, One Road Initiative. And the idea, the objective basically is to connect uh, the ancient silk, rate, uh, silk, uh, silk route, silk trade route, along with you know, the maritime, uh, silk maritime route. So what they, what they aim to do is basically to bring connectivity along these areas through railway lines, through seaports, and through roads. And uh, this project involves around like 60 different countries. The investment is estimated around 4 uh, trillion US dollar and 8 trillion US dollar. And it is believed that Asian, uh, Asia alone will need an investment of annually 900 billion dollar over the next 10 years. Um, and this basically has five components. You, know, you have the new Eurasian land bridge economic corridor basically running from Western China to and China, Mongol, Russia, economic running from Northern China to Eastern Russia, and then China, Central Asia, basically, you know, West Asia, to corridor basically running from Western China. And I think, you know, you can read it through and it becomes much more clear how big their ambition is. And then finally you have the Maritime Silk Road. Now this pretty much goes through the contested areas of South China Sea. So, Economically, it sounds very promising, but uh, there are a lot of political implications. Um, given China's uh, initiative to exert its economic influences to investment in different countries, we are already seeing sort of dissent emerging everywhere. For example, in Zambia, because of their mining activities, you know, a lot of people are uh, protesting against Chinese, you know, us. because during these sort of investment, they bring large number of settlers into these different countries and you see uh, there is growing dissent in Zambia and likewise in the case of Sri Lanka what I have observed is that uh, because Sri Lanka owes huge amount of debt to China uh, they are in a way sort of blackmailed to repay this debt through by passing over the ownership of their port to China which they say will be used for economic purposes but it has been argued that uh, that it has been used for military purposes as well. So you can see the, the extent of their ambition. And in a way, it can be seen as China's new form of imperialism. Now, I think it's also important when you talk about you know, uh, challenges, it's also important to kind of see and understand what are the internal challenges. So uh, last year, during the uh, Tibet Support Troops Conference in Brussels, um, we were able to conduct a survey and present a survey. Uh, I think we 
involved almost 91 different Tibet groups from around the world. And, and we realized that uh, a large number of the groups basically, uh, in terms of human resources, are very challenged. And uh, here, the red represents volunteers and the yellow represents uh, staffs. So you can clearly see, uh, according to a survey, we found that 19, 19% of these groups, they have staffs, and the remaining 81% are mainly volunteers. Um, and also, in terms of weaknesses, you know, there are a number of different weaknesses, especially in terms of you know capacity and human resource, and in terms of recruiting volunteers and retaining them. And one kind of challenge that I see most of the time is sort of lack of leadership, because you know most of these groups have been managed by you know. Uh, people now who are gradually retiring so there is this vacuum where we need to kind of fill it up with you know young leadership so that is uh, a challenge everywhere right yeah <laughs> okay so um, and I think um, uh, that's something you know we need to work on but you know having said that we also see a number of different opportunities you know for example um, the summits you have uh, China is also uh, kind of exerting its soft power in every form of and capacity, for example, you have Confucius Institutes, right? And uh, also, we have the 2022 Winter Olympics, um, uh, which I think we also collaborated one time with the Tibetan Day Association in Europe. And you have Chinese delegates visits and uh, using Chinese law to challenge uh, Chinese government. Um, and of course, like Tibet's environment issues plays a pivotal role, especially in this day and age when you talk about climate change. So there's a lot of opportunity. Now, um, I think that uh, when you talk about these um, challenges and opportunities and struggles of existence, um, I think one of sort of uh, the development that we see uh, and the efforts that uh, we have been making so far, I think mainly can be contributed to this person. Anyone have any idea who this person is? No one? Do you know Pythagoras? Pythagoras too? Okay. Well, okay. So, uh, this is my understanding. Uh, what it basically says is, you know, the square of hypotenuse is, you know, is a sum of two edges and sides. Now, in our case, you know, uh, the kind of uh, development emphasis that we have been making in this movement is, and I think you know, we need to make twice the effort, is that working together with activists from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And I think if you were able to make uh, twice the effort in, in terms of collaboration with Hong Kong and Taiwan, I think this would, in a way, help give twice the result for our Tibetan movement. So uh, that is how I see it. And I think with that, I would very briefly like to conclude the presentation. Usually I don't like talking for long, <laughs> unless it's a pop, pop conversation, right? So uh, I think that's it. Any questions? Oh, this is uh, uh, so you can say this is like the first of its kind, which was recently held in Taipei, in Taiwan. Uh, you have a group of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tibetan activists all get together and talking about you know the future of the countries, you know, freedom, democracy, and right to self determination. Okay, please. Uh, I just heard about the National Reserve, mm -hmm. um, and like, wouldn't that kind of the, the, I don't know if the reciprocal bill with the U.S. did it pass or what is happening. Because if they do make it a reserve, wouldn't like our tourists and like people be limited, like mm -hmm. they wouldn't have access. Are you talking about the Koko Shibi campaign? I think it's, uh, right, because it's it's a it's a vast stretch of uh, vast sorry stretch of grasslands, which uh, is inhibited by a large number of Tibetan nomads. But uh, China is trying to have a uh, heritage site by stating that this is a no man's land. So it gives them a lot of upper hand in terms of, you know, I don't know what, they could have any other agenda. So we are arguing that this is not a no man's land, it's a no man's land. So there are in the Tibet nomad inhabitants. And with regard to the reciprocal access to Tibet Act, I think it's still an ongoing sort of uh, campaign. Um, it, it began in 2015, but uh, there are efforts being made and uh, Congressman Joseph Pitts, now he's no longer a congressman, but it's largely being initiated by 
or handled by uh, Jim McGovern, who's still a congressman. So I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice or thoughts about how to make the Tibetan cause uh, relevant again? I feel like we were talking like, briefly with the other volunteers about how the Tibetan cause seemed really popular in like the 90s-ish. Mm -hmm. and it kind of is getting covered up by a lot of the other world crises. Mm -hmm. um, how can we make it more relevant? I think th that's the kind of the challenge that we observed through the survey, right? And I, 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 I don't have a sort of, you know, uh, a, sort of a, a very clear formula for this. But I think, you know, basically it, it kind of really ends down to your conscience, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's very important in order to kind of make any step, right, make any initiative. First of all, you want to make sure that what your conscience speaks is, is true to whatever you're supporting. And I think that's that's very important. And in terms of, um, I think one thing what we can do is to look for opportunities. For example, uh, this one belt, one road, I think I, I, I kind of saw it almost like two years ago, but it's very recent that a lot of, you know, people are talking about it. And especially, you know, given that they had this One Belt, One Road conference this year, um, India didn't participate in this because it has a lot of political implications. They're talking about specifically why, because India, it has its geopolitical issues. Because one part of this project involves Pakistan, China's China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is which was earlier estimated around like 46 billion US dollar, but now I think it's around 57 billion dollar. So there are a lot of, you know, uh, intricacies that we need to look into, understand into. But also, having said that, I think, you know, like, uh, uh, because when you're talking about China's economy, it's it's not a standalone entity. It has to depend on any other country to generate this economy. So for that, you have to depend on many different countries. And each country has their own sort of a framework of, uh, you know, administration or mechanism. And in that, you know, I think, I think this, especially this project, requires a lot of, I think, research. And I think that if you were able to thoroughly research, then we might find opportunities. For instance, if you look in cases like um, uh, Zambia, you can see people are not happy with Chinese, you know, projects where they bring large amount of settlers and then gradually they stay there, and then it's basically uh, and they are and people are being displaced for mining activities, and there's no job creation for local people, which is being handled, you know, taken over by the Chinese migrants. And this creates a lot of side effects, and there is an opportunity, and it, it kind of also resonates with uh, the Tibetan inside Tibet, also the nomads which are being displaced. So I think there are opportunities, and one of this project also extends to Kenya, the port of Kenya. And if you look at these projects, right, one belt, one road, they are basically connecting a lot of seaports. And in Kenya, we have the TSG Kenya Group, and which uh, we look forward to kind of you know updating them with more sort of uh, detailed information of what are the larger political implications and therefore they can make sure that they, they find these opportunities to uh, ensure that Tibet is always in the larger picture. So I think uh, that is how I think, and, uh, I'm sorry I don't have a sort of like a, an exact sort of formula for how to you know work this out, but I think um, things like working together with uh, Hong Kong activists and Taiwan activists, it's it's, it's something I think, I think it's, it's a great opportunity and basically we are uh, being challenged by the same opponent, right, China. And very soon, in July 1st, we will be releasing a joint statement together supporting, um, because July 1st is the 20th anniversary of handover of Hong Kong to China. But uh, the people in Hong Kong, they're not happy and we will be releasing a joint statement in support of, you know, freedom movement in Hong Kong. I would like to thank Mr. Jigdena and would like to present this small token of appreciation on behalf of Tibet Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.